NASA is at the forefront, forefront of pushing the most challenging missions to explore the moon, Mars, and beyond, and Artemis One is just the beginning. Right now, the Orion spacecraft is sitting atop the Space Launch System rocket on Launch Pad 39B here at Kennedy Space Center in Florida as they await their launch in a few days' time. Good morning. I'm Catherine Hamilton from NASA's Office of Communications. This mission would not be possible without our industry partners and contributions from more than 3,000 suppliers in all 50 states and 10 countries in Europe. The first of a series of increasingly complex missions, Artemis I is a flight test that will provide the foundation for human exploration in deep space and demonstrate NASA's commitment and capability to extend human presence to the, mar to the moon and beyond. Joining us here at Kennedy are several guests who will tell us about how their companies are working to advance our exploration goals to go to the moon and beyond. From NASA, we have Jim Free, Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development Mission Director at NASA Headquarters. Randy Likens, Vice President and General Manager of NASA Enterprise Solutions at Jacobs. Jeff Zotti, RS-25 Program Director from Aerojet Rocketdyne. Jennifer Bolin Masterson, Director of Operations at Michoud Assembly Facility with Boeing. Doug Hurley, Senior Director of Business Development with Northrop Grumman. Kelly DeFazio, Director of Orion Operations with Lockheed Martin. And Ralph Zimmerman, Head of Moon Programs and Orion European Service Module with Airbus. After a few opening comments from each of our speakers, we'll take questions from reporters here in the room, as well as those on the phone. For those listening on the phone, you can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue. So we'll start with Jim Free. Thanks, Catherine. Well, good morning, everyone. And it's really great to be here with our critical partners that have worked uh, hand in hand with us uh, to be here today, to have that vehicle on the pad that you see there and, and really be in a great place to, uh, to head to launch. Um, and this first launch is another step on the blueprint of our sustainable exploration of the, the solar system. And we are so proud uh, to be the leader with NASA, with our partners, uh, both uh, within the U.S. and externally. Um, the, that leadership and that international collaboration comes through our Artemis Accords. And as you saw in the vehicle there, the European service uh, module at the top. Um, a lot of questions about what are we doing differently. This time we're going sustainably. We want to stay on the lunar surface and learn on the lunar surface so that we uh, can do, get the most science and know how uh, we're going to go to Mars. Um, I talk about science. Science is first in what we're doing. Um, we, we, on Apollo, we did incredible science at the equator. This time we're going to the South Pole. There's much to learn at the South Pole, and it is truly our focal point. Um, and this is our exploration system. I hope that everyone takes some pride uh, nationally for what we've been able to do and where we are today. It's not been without difficulty, but today we're here to talk about the successes we've had of getting to the pad and developing this hardware for our long-term uh, exploration program. And we are a hardware-rich program. That does not happen in NASA all that often. Just a few miles from here, we have the uh, Orion crew module for Artemis II. We have the crew module for three. You'll hear about the development going on on those, on the core stage for future missions, on the advanced programs we have. So hardware rich is a great place to be. Artemis I is that first step down this path. When we talk about sustained exploration on the lunar surface and getting onto Mars, Artemis I is that step. And uh, the countdown starts tomorrow, which is incredibly hard to believe. I feel like I just sat here the other night after the FRR, and here we are starting the countdown tomorrow. Our next step beyond this is Artemis II. We're, we're, we're putting crew on Artemis II, and we're exercising the systems on one to a great extent to make sure that when we put crew on two, the vehicle's ready to go. So everything that you see here, a longer duration mission, um, uh, more time in lunar orbit. Every minute we spend, we learn about the vehicle and buy down the risk for crew on two. Artemis three, uh, we're right uh, on the precipice of that as well, where we're going to land the first woman and the first person of color in this Artemis program. Um, that, as vehicles coming together today, too, our human lander, 
uh, is, is being developed. I talked about the, the crew module, the surface suits that we'll need. All of that is coming together. Again, a hardware rich and near term program. And Artemis IV, where we uh, fly to Gateway and we're orbiting around uh, the moon and landing from Gateway, again, expanding our international partnership. partnership. And this is the group that really makes it happen here. It's so great to see the U.S. companies represented and our, our Airbus partner here as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Randy Likens from Jacobs to hear about everything they've done on exploration ground systems. Thank you, Jim. Well, good morning. It's great to see you all. Today we're going to talk about the progress that we've made uh, on future Artemis missions. But before we get into that future work, I want to take just a minute and recognize the milestone that we're coming up on Monday. Um, the NASA Kennedy Space Center Exploration Ground Systems Team and the Jacobs Contractor Workforce uh, have done an amazing job assembling and integrating and prepping this vehicle for launch. This new deep space exploration system is going to take us back to the moon and uh, to new science discoveries that we can't even imagine yet. NASA is about to make history with this first flight of the Artemis program, and Jacobs is proud to be part of the team. Uh, Artemis I is going to prove the capability of the SLS and Orion and Exploration Ground Systems architecture and test the vehicle to ensure that we can safely carry crew on Artemis II and then return to the moon on Artemis III. Here at Kennedy Space Center, the Exploration Ground Systems team is busy upgrading the systems and infrastructure needed to process future uh, Artemis missions. So let's go ahead and start that out. If we could put up our first slide, please. We'll go to the pad. Launch Complex 39 Pad B is uh, where we're going to be launching from. And this is a photograph of the uh, liquid hydrogen tank. There's been some major upgrades at the pad. The first thing you'll see is the uh, sphere a liquid hydrogen tank. That is the largest tank uh, for liquid hydrogen that's ever been constructed. Holds 1.4 million gallons, million gallons of liquid hydrogen. And it's going to give NASA the uh, flexibility to have multiple launch attempts in the future as we go forward. Um, Let's uh, also talk about upgrades to the environmental control system. We have to provide conditioned air and gaseous nitrogen to the vehicle, both Orion and SLS, as we prepare and, and go through the countdown. So those uh, support systems to do that are in, are in work right now. Uh, the crew emergency egress system, obviously we don't need that on the first mission, but we will on Artemis II and future missions as we carry crew. So our emergency escape system or egress system is under construction. Um, Let's go ahead and go on to the mobile launcher then and the VAB, which is another major portion of the ground systems here at Kennedy. The mobile launcher that you see there, uh, I think on your right, is mobile launcher one. That is configured for the block one configuration of the vehicle. That uh, mobile launcher will be used for the first three Artemis missions. Uh, that, that ML is getting the uh, emergency egress system installed on it as soon as we get back from uh, launching Artemis one. We've got 15 additional ground systems that are going upgrades and modifications to prepare for the uh, crew version of the vehicle and future uh, growth versions of, of SLS. Uh, the second mobile launcher, which is not pictured there, is in, currently in design and construction under a separate contract. Um, let's go on and talk about, about the VAB. Um, within the VAB itself, the, the assembly building, uh, there are High Bay 3 is where we're constructing, stacking, integrating the launch vehicle and, and the spacecraft. And we're going to be making upgrades there to prepare for future missions. The environmental control system is under construction for future missions to accommodate the crew requirements. Uh, we've also got fabrication of new platforms that are going to be happening to uh, accommodate the Block 1B with the exploration upper stage as we evolve this vehicle and give it new, new capabilities. High Bay 4 uh, within the VAB is also going to be upgraded to accommodate the EUS processing itself. That's a, that's a large upper stage and it's going to have some special requirements. Um, in addition to the hardware, we also have the launch control software that, that we're responsible for. So even as we are executing the, the Artemis 1 launch campaign, we're also working in parallel on the uh, advanced versions of the, of the ground uh, control software, which will handle the countdown and then the launch process itself for the uh, crude versions of the, of the vehicle. So that software is already 50% complete. We've hit that milestone. 
We're going to be using that early next year for ground systems testing, and uh, that will be ready in time to support the Artemis II launch in 2024. We've also got some modifications going on within the landing and recovery world. Uh, after this 42-day mission, when the uh, Orion capsule splashes down, we'll be recovering that, and so we're getting ready for that and, and preparing to be able to recover crew on future versions as well. I've talked a lot about hardware. Let me talk about people for just a minute. Um, Artemis II, the, the, the next mission in this campaign, is going to be another first with upgraded flight hardware, modified ground systems, and next generation software. But the key to making this all work together is the people. And the ground ops team has really earned its spurs through the Artemis I campaign. The wet dress rehearsals that we've had have been a fabulous learning experience and the team has ex executed more than 30 countdown simulations as they get ready for the challenge of launching Artemis I. So my bottom line is that we're moving out with the upgrades and the modifications required to begin processing flight hardware for subsequent missions. And the plans, designs, and construction of upgrades needed for Artemis II, III, and IV are in the pipeline as well. So thank you very much. And next up will be Jeff Zotti from Aerojet Rocketdyne. All right. Thank you, Randy. Um, let me first uh, start by saying we're very excited about Monday's launch, and we see this as a generational rocket. Um, and Aerojet Rocketdyne is doing everything that we can to make it a big success. So if we can go to the first image, as you may know, we're reusing uh, 16 space shuttle main engines uh, to support the first four Artemis missions. Now we're adapting those engines with new engine controllers. That's the brain of the engine. We're also adding a thermal protection system to the nozzles, and we're upgrading the software. The image you see is of the work platform at Aerojet Rocketdyne's engine assembly facility at Stennis Space Center, where the work is being performed. And I'm happy to say that that work is well ahead of schedule. Um, Artemis II engines are complete and ready to ship. Uh, three of the four Artemis III engines are ready, and the fourth is nearly complete. And we've even started to assemble uh, two of the Artemis IV engines. So if we go to the next image, you'll see a photo of our RS-25 certification engine, which is also being assembled at Stennis Space Center. Now, we are restarting production after a 15-year gap. And while we're maintaining the safety and the reliability of the RS-25 engine, we'll all, we're also introducing targeted redesigns to reduce cost. Those changes need to be certified. And so the assembly of our certification engine is 90% complete. That engine is going to start testing later this year, and it'll continue testing through the middle of 2023. And if we can go to the last image, uh, this is a picture of our nozzle braze furnace uh, located in our Canoga Park facility in California. This is the largest furnace in the country. Um, Aerojet Rocketdyne has invested to increase the capacity in our a Canoga facility. We are also modernizing our manufacturing techniques, including using 3D printing. We've got 39 components that are 3D printed. That means uh, reduced part count, reduced touch labor, and reduced cycle time. We're also ramping up production. We've got components in work through Artemis 9. And so the combination of targeted redesigns, uh, modern manufacturing techniques, and a ramp up in production is enabling us to reduce the cost of our new engines by 30%. So now let me turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to talk a little bit about our future. And so let's go to the next slide. The first three Artemis will be the SLS Block 1. Artemis 4 is evolving into our Exploration Upper Stage EUS Block 1B. This will enable sustainable and scientific rich explorations for the SLS missions. This is why EUS and Block 1B is so important. EUS is going to be able to provide 97,000 pounds of thrust versus the Block 1 at 25,000. So what does that mean? It means it's three times the amount of lift power to get us to the moon and beyond. It also provides 40% more payloads or 38 metric tons, or 83,000 pounds. SLS with EUS provides payloads that co-manifest with the Orion capabilities, potential missions that the, pay, 
that uh, launch on SLS and with EUS can include large Earth obser observation uh, satellites. It can include uh, space telescopes, and it can also include missions to our outer planets and their moon. Next, please. Boeing is and has been committed into improving our production and manufacturing processes by utilizing lean principles. We have taken our core stage one and core stage two, our lessons learned, and have applied them to our EUS exploration upper stage before we even start production. A couple examples of that is with our design of our tools. We are utilizing some of the same tools that produce core stage, we're producing EUS right off of the same thing. We have also improved our design and process improvements. When we talk about the installation and the testing of our wire harnesses, we have seen improvement and we have applied those to our EUS. And along with utilizing friction stir welding, not only does that provide us weight improvements for our article, but it also improves our quality and our schedule. In our factory today, we are producing the weld confidence articles along with our structural test articles for EUS. And core stage four is in the production build also. So it's exciting times today, but also for our future. With that, I will turn it over to Doug Hurley with Northam Grumman. Thank you. We're L minus three. It's just an exciting time. I can't wait to see that thing launch on Monday morning. I uh, hope everybody can make it out uh, and bring your families as well. Um, certainly from my perspective and uh, north of Grumman's perspective, you know, we've had a wonderful heritage with the solid rocket boosters, you know, supporting shuttle. And we're fortunate enough to have eight flight sets to support Artemis 1 through 8 with our heritage shuttle boosters. Now we've improved them as far as adding a segment. So we've improved the thrust by 25%. And we continue to optimize our design as we fly out that hardware from our booster obsolation, obsolescence and life extension program, or BOLE. I don't want to use too many terms, but uh, that's our Artemis 9 boosters and beyond where we, we can go to the slide, please, where we go to a composite case and do uh, significant improvements, as you can see, you know, including structure and propellant materials. We've got an electronic thrust vector control that we're going to be using. Uh, as well as some nozzle throat expansion. And it gives Artemis SLS the capability of roughly five metric tons of additional capability. So it's really, really impressive. So we're already hard at work at that. And you can see some of the other things we're doing as far as in, you know, uh, increasing our burn times. We're doing some other optimization along the way and really tweaking the design to, to take Artemis to that next step. Next slide, please. You can see here, this is a case winding for our DM1 test motor. So this will be our first Bole test motor that we fire. Uh, we're targeting 2024 at this time. Uh, we're also doing some other work with Marshall Space Flight Center. You can see in the upper right corner there is a subscale motor test, and we've done three of those with a 24-inch solid rocket booster. So we're working very hard to support Artemis 1 through 8 uh, with our current shuttle hardware. And then we're looking very much forward to flying uh, our new boosters on Artemis 9. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Kelly now for a little bit of Lockheed Martin. All right. Thanks, Doug. Like my colleagues, the team at Lockheed Martin are totally energized to be here just days away from the Artemis 1 test flight because that test is going to give us the information and the data we need to prove out our systems and make Artemis 2 successful as well. So if you go to the first image, you can see the Artemis II crew module is well on its way in fabrication in the operations and checkout facility here at Kennedy Space Center. We did the initial power on activities earlier this year, and it is going through its test phase and will uh, roll into the integration of the other uh, components for Artemis II and deliver into NASA's hands in 2024. In addition to Artemis II, we have Artemis III's crew module also in the ONC facility, and it is going through its primary and secondary structural installation, and later this year will go into the clean room for welding activities to install the propulsion system as well as the ECLIS systems. 
Artemis IV also in work. Artemis IV's crew module, the pressure vessel, is being fabricated at our Mishu assembly facility with our Lockheed Martin team there, also using the uh, friction, uh, the friction stir weld uh, for optimizing that pressure vessel. And it will be delivered here early next year, about the February timeframe. And that's going to put us exactly where we need to be here at Kennedy Space Center with three spacecraft inflow at once. It's that rate that we need to be ramped up to to meet the one over one, the mission over mission annual rate for NASA, and we are on plan to meet that. Artemis V also being built. Uh, Artemis V is across our 2,900 suppliers in all 50 states, including Puerto Rico, as well as 11 countries. And that Artemis V hardware is being built uh, as we speak and will be rolling into uh, its uh, integration facilities as we move into the next few years. So Lockheed Martin is committed to reduce the Orion production contract uh, to deliver spacecraft 50 percent um, cheaper than we were from the early stages of the flight hardware. And a couple of the ways that we're doing this is not only the economies of scale that we just talked about, the bulk buy, capitalizing on bulk buys, uh, but we're also creating infrastructure and production efficiencies and using digital transformation and state-of-the-art uh, tooling with augmented reality as well as flight hardware reuse. The flight hardware reuse is critical to Orion spacecraft cost reduction. We actually uh, have on this mission, Artemis I, we have used uh, a flight battery from our EFT-1 mission, our test flight in 2014. We've taken a flight battery from that, we've repurposed it, and it is actually sitting on board Artemis I, as well as a couple of uh, harnesses from our test phase of EFT-1. From Artemis I to Artemis II, we will take 16 components. Most of those are, are high-dollar avionics. One is the uh, crew seat that uh, Commander Munikin Campos is sitting in, will be repurposed and become part of Artemis II. And then as in a usual engineering uh, phased approach, we're going to ramp up that number for reuse uh, from Artemis II through to five. We're going to be uh, in the realm of about 600 reusable parts. And then from Artemis three to six, upwards of 5,000 parts. So we are ramping up quickly and our team is working hard to qualify all of that for uh, multiple use. Some of them are on five missions, some of them are two missions, and as we gain this information and data from this test flight and Artemis II, we might be able to increase from there. If you go to the next chart, uh, this shows a uh, couple of our mechanics and technicians using augmented reality. On the left is the crew seat assembly at our Mishu assembly factory using uh, HoloLens goggles. And on the right, we have a mechanic at the ONC facility, and she's placing uh, click bonds on flight bracketry there uh, using the HoloLens. So if you can imagine, you know, HoloLens augmented reality, it's not quite like your, your virtual gaming goggles at home where the whole world is blocked out. You can actually see the, the hardware and, and the people in front of you because you certainly don't want to run over anybody while you're doing this. Uh, so you can see the external environment around, you can see the hardware you're working on, but overlaid on top of that, you can either see the CAD models, you can see the uh, instructions, the instructions are in the field of view, tells you uh, what you need to do with the hardware you're looking at, what tool to use, and, um, and all of the features. So imagine no, no more uh, manual double checking, what did that instruction say, let me walk over here, let me walk over there. Uh, there's uh, also... Uh, an added feature well, where when you start to combine these tools together, we've seen upwards of a 30 percent cost reduction to the, to the mechanic and the productions on the floor, 300 percent a reduction. So uh, this is just a couple of examples of how we are using that particular um, augmented reality. In addition to that and other digital transformation projects with smart tools, uh, we are also incorporating the 3D additive manufacturing in our flight hardware and driving the cost down. So Lockheed Martin and our Orion partners are committed to this. And again, we are extremely excited to be a part of the NASA manifest and the architecture to go to deep space and beyond. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ralph Zimmerman for Airbus and Service Module. Thank you very much, Kelly. Yes, let me just continue where my uh, partners already stopped. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. 
all Airbus is very excited to be part of the team. And I guess it's a great mission, and it's the first time ever in history of NASA. The NASA trusts the non, basically non-U.S. company to contribute to a major program in, in NASA. And I guess let me explain a bit why we think this is a, we deserve this kind of trust. Airbus has quite a heritage in space systems. We have already built and delivered the Space Lab. We have built the, uh, for the ISS the Columbus module. And even more than that, we have built the automatic transfer vehicle and delivered five of those who, uh, vehicles which automatically provided goods, fuel, and, and consumables to the space station. And basically what we're building now, the European service module, is a derivative or, which is based on all the knowledge which we have gained in the automatic transfer vehicle. And as such, I guess the trust is there. Uh, we can come to the first picture, please. We have, I, I basically put some people in front because we were very excited that NASA and all the top, the top guns of NASA were visiting us. Thank you, Bill, for coming. Uh, this was really great. It was a great inspiration for all our team. But it showed also that NASA is willing to trust the European partners. And for me, and I um, have quite a history in the space business, international cooperation is quite key if you want to go to moon and even beyond. So in this kind of sen in this sense, I'd say uh, the cooperation is great. We have an excellent interface with Lockheed Martin, with our agencies in between, with NASA and ESA. And as such, a great team can move a mountain. And I give, don't, this time we don't want to move a mountain, but we want to fly around the moon. Cool. So let me uh, give some, some words towards uh, what, we are, what we are building. Uh, go to the next slide, please. This is just a sketch of the not fully equipped uh, European service module. It is quite densely packed, I might say. And this is not yet even full. So the, all the tanks are yet missing. So we have more than 20,000 piece parts to integrate in this uh, diameter of a bit more than four meters and height of also a bit more than five, uh, around five meters. We integrate quite a lot. We have more than eight tons of propellant. We provide later with our solar arrays about 11 kilowatts of electric power. We have all the consumables for the astronauts, the oxygen, nitrogen, water. And we take care for the uh, environmental control of the capsule in terms of that we uh, do the cooling and provide the energy for the heating. And as such, I guess the cooperation with the in, inside the Orion team between Lockheed Martin and Airbus providing the service module is working really great. And uh, I'd like to thank all to the colleagues that this works this well. And you can imagine it's not that easy, uh, especially in the last two years, which were a bit blocked by personal contact. Uh, we were happy to make this, and now we have delivered not only the first one, which is on the rocket. Actually, we delivered it already two years ago, I might say, <laughs> since then here in testing. The second one is also over here in KSC, being just mated with the, with the crew module currently and tested. Number three and four are integration in, in Bremen, in north of Germany, in our integration site. And we are under contract for uh, up to number six. So the structure for number five will arrive before Christmas and for number six even before mid of next year. And we are increasing our integration capabilities to handle really three ESMs in, in one, at one time in our facility. And I guess with that, we are prepared to deliver uh, one module per one ESM per year and achieve the cadence which we all want to see. And thank you for that. I'm handing back to Catherine. Thank you. We'll now take questions from reporters here in the room, as well as those joining us on the phone. For those joining on the phone, please press star one to be entered into the queue. We're also taking questions on social media using the hashtag ask uh, Artemis, excuse me. Um, and uh, when, you, when we go to you, please state your name, your affiliation, and to whom your question is directed. Uh, we ask that you please stick to one question so that everyone has a chance to ask a question. And if we have time, we'll come around for um, for another round of questions. Um, all right, so I see a few hands here in the room. Let's go over here um, on the second row over here. Oh. 
Oh, thank you. I'm Mark Corot with uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. And I think my question's for uh, Mr. Free. Do you um, have some estimate of the number of companies globally that have contributed and even perhaps the number of personnel that work um, around the world, if not around the world, in the U.S. that are involved in this? And so I think Catherine said at the beginning, at, at overall it's been, I think, over 3,000 companies uh, that have participated. I will throw out another number that 700 small businesses as well. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's tremendous that, that small businesses play a role in this. Um, I don't have the workforce numbers off the top of my head, though. I think we can follow up with you on that, Mark. I, I, I know I saw them yesterday, but if I quote them wrong, I can't look to my right because someone will be a little bit upset with me. So we owe you that, though, Mark. All right, let's go uh, here to the front row. Hi, I'm Jim Siegel. I'm with uh, nasatech.net. And I believe my question is probably directed at Jim, although I'm not sure. Maybe the rest of you will chime in. Um, uh, when, when Artemis was announced a few years ago, uh, I, I recall that there was a, an effort to go through Artemis 1, here's Artemis 2, Artemis 3, Artemis and here's what we do on each one of those. And y you've touched on uh, those, but I wondered if you could kind of go through the list starting with say, number two, and what is the goal of each one of those, and what's the time frame for each one of those going out to Artemis 9 or whatever the, the highest number is? Can you do that, please? Sure. So just one is our uncrewed test flight, where we're buying down uh, a lot of the risks that are in the system and, and even flying, a, I'll say, a riskier mission with some of the durations we picked. Two is a crewed flight. Uh, so I should say one goes into a distant retrograde orbit. Two is a crewed flight um, where we'll, uh, again, prove out uh, more systems, the environmental control and life support systems. Um, that will go on a free return trajectory to the moon, um, again, buying down the risk so that we don't have to fire to come home. Uh, three will go into the uh, near rectilinear halo orbit with the human lander and land. Four will go to Gateway, where uh, it'll be the first flight of the Block 1B vehicle that was mentioned earlier, where we'll take a co-manifested payload, another international payload, and dock that to Gateway. Um, five will take another co-manifested payload. Um, on, it will also uh, bring in the lunar terrain vehicle on the surface. Um, and then when we get six and beyond, we start talking about potential airlock, um, and then seven, we get into a cadence of uh, where we're, we're doing more science. We start to bring in, on the later mission, 789, we bring in a pressurized rover. We start looking at surface habitation. Um, and so that w as we're going through our yearly mission, we're maximizing the science. We're also designing things like LTV to be uh, on the surface and when the crew's not there to be operated uh, to do science. Uh, much like we operate the Mars rovers today. That definition, when we get six, seven, eight, nine, that's what we're going through right now. Um, honestly, when you look at the schedule for four and all the elements that have to come together, it is a, a significant emotional event um, of how all that comes together because, you know, it's, it's, it's like, hey, at that point, we're full steam ahead into our, into our missions. Um, so, so, so we're at one through five. We're working the details of six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And at the same time, we're developing our architecture through some of the objectives work that we've done recently through our deputy administrator, um, going through the, the broad exploration objectives, and then narrowing down to an architecture which we're, uh, which takes us out to Mars. And we're looking at you know, rolling through that architecture decisions and process uh, in the early part of next year. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Did I see another hand? We'll go over here to the second row. Hey, 
Yes, thank you. Uh, Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com, and I, I believe my question is for Jennifer. I'm, I'm curious about the, the development of the exploration upper stage for that Artemis IV flight, uh, just because it seems like a, a fairly large leap uh, with a lot of demands for that mission. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what will the, the testing regime be? Do you need to fly an uncrewed uh, uh, a test on a different type of a booster just to kind of prove it out uh, before Artemis IV, or, or how, do you, how do you go about testing that? As I kind of explained a little bit, you know, we're going through our structural um, weld articles right now, uh, making sure everything looks good there. Our structural test articles will be, again, another way to prove our capability. Now, our EUS-44 will go through to the Stennis uh, Space Center where we will do a hot fire, very similar to Core Stage 1 where we did a hot fire at Stennis, and then come to the KSC-4 launch. So that is kind of our development plan and how we're going to prove out our capabilities with our EUS. Thank you. Next, we'll take a question from the phone. We have Andrew Tangle of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, yes, hi there. How are you? Um, I didn't know if the uh, members of the, of the panel from the industry could uh, maybe outline how uh, profitable this program has been for their companies and give us a sense of how, as NASA tries to reduce costs for the future missions and shift some of the risk and financial responsibility to the industry, how willing your companies are to accept lower profit margins or even losses on future missions as this goes forward. So we'll start um, with Jacobs and then go down the row here. Okay, sure. Uh, as, as we evolve and work through future missions, we fully expect to see the uh, workforce requirements, for example, um, changing as we get smarter and we get more experience in processing ground hardware, uh, developing the new systems. Um, the, the labor required to do any particular operation should absolutely, absolutely be going down, and we anticipate that on future contracts. Um, I can't really speak to how profitable uh, a particular contract is specifically, but um, it's it's in their public domain. It's in the it's in the uh, uh, it's in the public domain out there. So I'm sure that information can be found. But uh, at any rate, we we want this to be a 30-year sustainable program, as as NASA has talked about. So we realize we all have a part to save money, to uh, be more efficient as we go forward, to bring in new technology, and I. I can certainly speak for Jacobs to say that that's our approach. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Um, from my perspective, Aerojet Rocketdyne, first I, I would applaud NASA for what they're doing to look for solutions that make producing and operating this vehicle more affordable. Um, what I would expect is, you know, we're, we're excited about this in, in the future as we see the, the launch manifest stabilize and we see the launch cadence stabilize to at least one launch per year, maybe two launches per year. Uh, I would expect us to come down those learning curves. And, you know, the continuous improvement, I, it's a journey that doesn't end. So we're going to always look for opportunities to reduce costs. Um, that's not going to stop. Yeah, you kind of took the words right out of my mouth there. Uh, you know, it is really important for us to continue, continuously innovate and find better ways of processing, designing, all of that to make this affordable. We are here for the long haul. We want this future. And so our teams are consistently, day in and day out, I'm on the shop floor and they're talking about, hey, I have a good idea to make this a better way of producing it, or hey, could we go do this? So, you know, it, it's really, taking our teammates and their innovation ideas and really putting them to the test and getting them implemented. And so we are con going to continue to do that day in and day out. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. You know, we at Northrop Grumman were committed to a significant reduction in cost as we, you know, responded to the EPOC with our partners. You know, we understand that this, this program needs to be sustained. We understand that, you know, and we're going to do our part in reducing costs and efficiencies wherever we can get. And as I said before, our newer boosters, that's just going to lean things even more. And, and, and you know, we are 
working together. We work very well together with our industry partners, and we're going to continue to do that to make this program successful. And as mentioned earlier, Lockheed Martin is committed to reducing the cost by 50 percent in our production run. And, you know, we are on a, uh, from a design development program, we're on the cost plus award fee contract. We have transitioned to the cost plus incentive fee contract in our production runs and working into the firm fixed price. So that, that all works together. It's, you know, the way we need to start shifting the risk in the, you know, from the government to the industry and make sure that we are all driving our costs down for that sustainable future because we absolutely are here for making Artemis uh, a program for decades to come, and that's the way we're going to do it. Yeah, being the last one in the row, leaves little to add of what all my colleagues have already said uh, very rightly. Uh, maybe just something which is worth to note here, um, because it might not be clear. The European part is finance, uh, so we are in a contract with the European Space Agency, and this is based on a agreement from agency to agency, so we are not working on American taxpayers' money. We are working on European taxpayers' money. Maybe this helps to understand. Thanks. We'll take another question from the phone. Uh, Laura Winter of Defense and Aerospace Report. Good morning, everybody. This is for the Primes and also for the NASA reps. Without taking away from your accomplishments in the, in the least, you know, space is a team sport, and you all have mentioned locations around the United States, like Stennis and the city of Canoga Park and California. Lots of work also occurred in Ohio, um, testing at the NASA facility, but there's also lots of additive industries there. Can you share the glory a bit and talk about the small and medium-sized businesses that have and are supporting this launch and the coming missions? Can you give a few examples? Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, boy, I, I went to a supplier event, I, I forget when, down here uh, a few months ago, and, uh, <clears throat> and met uh, some folks that were making a, a particularly uh, – a difficult part for uh, for SLS, and uh, it was a, a mechanical part, a mechanical, small mechanical actuator, and it was like this gentleman who started the business from the ground up himself, um, and he had, he and his wife were down here and kind of swimming in the sea of of like wow, I've never been part of anything like this, and actually got to meet. Doug Hurley, uh, they got to meet Doug Hurley, which is a highlight for anybody. But, um, uh, but, but for them, you know, to see their, uh, I'll say their excitement uh, renewed for me uh, the value of what we do, uh, both uh, at the big and small level, and just what we do for inspiration. But my other colleagues might have some other small business examples. Yeah, I, I would comment on that. In my, you know, my former career. You know, we spent a lot of time visiting these smaller shops. You know, they contributed the shuttle, and we started doing the same thing as we were turning towards SLS. And I, I, I agree, it's just it's amazing these small companies. They build one part or two parts, but the emphasis on understanding how important those parts are to the overall mission and how can it, they can have an, either a great effect or an adverse effect. And and. And it's just incredible to just see at those supplier conferences the, the small companies all around the United States that contribute to this program. All right. Uh, we'll take another question from here in the room. We'll go over here to the second row. Thank you, Tarek Malik with Space.com for Ralph. I'm curious about Airbus's experience with this service module and building that for um, uh, like a, a future vehicles that you may have planned uh, for European uh, crewed flights, things in an evolution of, of ATV, perhaps. Uh, you know, what sort of lessons have you uh, drawn uh, from the, uh, the service module here that can be applied to future European spacecraft? Thanks. Well, the uh, service module is, uh, in terms, if you compare it to the automatic transfer vehicle, uh, just a part of it, basically, because the automatic transfer vehicle also had all the avionics, logistics, onboard computer inside, and, and a big uh, cargo trunk up front to deliver space goods. Uh, 
Nevertheless, the, uh, what we learned on top, of course, and what we did is uh, it's not, the service module is not completely human rated. The ATV was only partly human rated just for the docking phase when it really approached the space station. So by that, uh, we have additional redundancy inside, and of course, we learn a lot with that. And uh, I guess we have learned already previously how we can reliably pro reliably produce these kind of very complex uh, stages. So, and as such, uh, now we are optimizing, as our colleague said before, in the cost reduction to see what we can do and, and narrow it down to make sure we have an industrialized production and get out one per year. This is our goal. And we have invested at Airbus to have really three in, in parallel in our clean room facilities. hope this answers your question. Thank you. We'll take another question from the phone. We have Marvin Marshall with Nighttime News Space Report. Hi, my name is Marvin Marshall from the Nighttime News Space Report on Twitch.tv. My question is for Doug Hurley. Uh, Doug, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, being the first commander on board the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and Crew Dragon, you know, I'm sure you've worked very closely with SpaceX you know, to make that flight happen with Bob. Now, what did working with SpaceX on advancing human exploration by making you know, Falcon 9 human-rated teach you, and, and how much confidence did that whole process give you and our ability to return to the moon and lunar surface aboard a SpaceX, you know, Starship and Orion capsule in the coming years with the Artemis program? Thank you. Hey, Marvin, great question. Um, yeah, it, it's a process, right? You know, we had a great team, a small, relatively small team at NASA that worked with SpaceX, and the collaboration was incredible. Um, and, I, you know, I've seen that. I, I didn't get to do a ton of work with Orion and SLS just because my last five or six years at NASA was working uh, with SpaceX and with our NASA team to get us to ISS in 2020. So, um, but it, it's a very similar mindset. You, you know, you, you have your ups and downs. You work through those processes. Um, uh, you know, people remember we had some pretty significant ups and downs uh, getting to the launch pad with SpaceX. Um, and, you know, I, this, what I like about Artemis 1 and this, this flight test, this end-to-end -end flight test, is we're really pushing the hardware on this particular flight to give us that confidence to put crew on it uh, on Artemis 2. And very similar mindset as to what we did with DM-1. If you remember, we flew an uncrewed test flight uh, as well. Uh, we also flew an in-flight abort test. Um, and then we put crew on, on Falcon 9 and Dragon. So, I, I really like the direction where we're going from, you know, a former test pilot, and, and this is a very measured approach, but we're being really aggressive with, with what we're asking the hardware to do on this particular flight. So we have total confidence when we put our crew on board. Thank you. We'll take a question from social media. Hey, thanks so much. I've got a question from Twitter, and I think this one is for Lockheed. What improvements have been made since the navigation systems? What improvements have been made to the navigation system since the Apollo years? <laughs> <laughs> wow, how, how long do we have? <laughs> yeah, <what> <laughs> so, uh, you know, over the last week, I'll, I will, I've heard a lot of the um, information and a lot of seen a lot of the facts flying around of the comparison between Apollo and Orion, you know, all the way down to the the, the shape itself, you know, and, and um, you know, there's certain things that that you just don't need to change and shouldn't change, like the shape, right, for the dynamics, the flight dynamics of the uh, of the of the spacecraft. Uh, the the advances in all of the avionics, the navigation, the guidance, the flight computing is just um, monumental. I mean, if you can just imagine, you know, back in the '60s. Nobody even had a PC. So I mean, it just when you talk about the flight equipment, uh, it is it is not even in comparison um, down to the power. Right? They had fuel cells on Apollo. We have solar cells uh, on Orion. You know, and you can just go down the list, and it would take a long time. But um, I think I remember a, a fact that said that um, the computing power. I'll just put it this way: the computing power on Orion is 4,000 times greater than on Apollo. So that just kind of puts it in perspective. And all of our, our partners are incorporating all the state-of-the-art technology to make that happen as a system. Um, so it's, it is the same in some aspects. Some of the materials are the same. 
but the computing power and the technology to build this spacecraft, it is the, the safest spacecraft for humans ever created. For our astronauts, it will go farther than we've ever gone before on Artemis I, uh, 40,000 miles beyond the moon, and we are super excited to see how it perform. That heat shield on the back end is going to um, uh, show us how we've taken that material from the Apollo days and uh, brought that into the 21st century from a new way of manufacturing it, as well as larger. The, the uh, Orion is about 30 percent larger than the Apollo crew module or capsule as well. So uh, some things are the same. We've built on, on the past and just made it thousands times better. Uh, you know, we're standing on the shoulder of giants, but we're ready to go. And I think, yeah, I saw one more question over here in the, looks like third row. Hi, my name is Kane Fairbaugh. I'm with Voice of America. And my question is um, less technical and a little bit more emotional. Um, certainly, most of you um, were either little or not even born yet when all of this happened the last time. And if you've got children, they have certainly have never seen this occur in their own lifetimes. And maybe you could each maybe share some of the emotional sort of uh, response it is to be in this moment, you know, close to the launch where this is all going to start again. And you're at the end of a very, you know, long process. But maybe tell us how you feel emotionally right now to be in this moment. Start here with Jim. All right. Let's start with Ralph. He keeps <laughs> having to go last. Uh, let's start with Ralph. No, to start with this. Uh, you're fully right. This is an extremely emotional moment. And in my career, I have launched several spacecraft, so this is not the first one, but certainly one of the most exciting ones. This is no question. Yeah. Uh, usually, you have a lot of tension. I mean, during during the development program, you have uh, problems to solve. You have interfaces to solve, and finally, you make it. And then this is the moment when it comes to the countdown, yeah, and then tension starts, and well, let's cross fingers, everything works well, yeah, tension is rising, and we are fully excited here. So for me, I, this is a, a personally exciting moment for me as well. I was uh, born and raised in Titusville, and my parents came down from Pennsylvania to be a part of the uh, Apollo program, and so I'm the Apollo generation, you know, times one, I guess, X1, <laughs> and the, and just super excited for me to be here and uh, kicking off the Artemis generation. And to see that in one lifetime is, is quite incredible. Um, uh, my family, you know, uh, my, met my husband uh, as part of the aerospace industry. My son's in it now. And my daughter was talking about the other day how they're coming. They're all coming in to see the, the, the launch on, on Monday. And uh, I asked her. You know, what do you what do you think about this? Because she's not in the industry, but she's certainly seen her dad and, and I working in it for a lifetime. And um, she says, you know, I think it's really cool. And she said, I can't wait for my grandkids to tell me, um, hey, uh, Grandma, we can't come over this weekend. We're going to go vacation on Mars. So um, do you want us to bring you something? And she's going to say, just bring me a picture. But, you know, I was there on day one. So we're, you know, we're excited as a family. And uh, we've got a uh, Lockheed Martin team flying in and driving in from all over the country. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a lot of fun. And we're going to be excited. And we're going to watch every single day of those 42 day uh, of the mission and and just you know, looking forward to that information come flowing in and take all that and go from there. Okay. You know, it it's really um, mixed for me. Um, you know, I, I feel so much for the teams having gone through this to a smaller scale for six years trying to get uh, back to space station. And now the amount of time the amount of people people have spent parts significant parts of their career already to get this rocket to the pad and i'm just so happy for them and excited for for the nation for the globe to to be going back to the moon and then hopefully beyond to mars in the not too distant future so um it's a little odd for me being on the other side of it not in quarantine at crew quarters uh, getting ready to go fly the rocket but um, just have ultimate confidence in this team and um, you know looking forward to seeing some some of my friends get to fly this rocket in the very near future so just exciting and uh, just want to tell everybody you know just live in this moment this is a big big deal take it all in and enjoy it the next few days it's going to be fun 
Uh, for me personally, you know, I, uh, a little over four years ago is when I joined the program, and so I moved my family to uh, New Orleans at the Michoud Assembly Facility. Um, and, you know, my family got to experience all the challenges. They got to hear from me about all the challenges that we were going through. And uh, so I can't even put words into it of how I feel. It, it's, it's unbelievable. And I'll tell you, the team out at uh, MAF, uh, their energy level is to the to the nth degree. You know, I remember when we rolled out on January 8th of 2020, the first core stage going to Stennis, and the, it was electrifying. And then when we completed Hot Fire, it was amped up a bit. And then when we got it here and we passed Wet Dress again up, now it, everyone is taking it in the moment. You know, we've got lots of teammates coming out this way to watch it. We're making sure for those folks, that those teammates that could not make it out here, we've got a watch party at the factory ready for them to go and celebrate the huge accomplishments they've had. You know, we went in through this COVID, you know, two years of COVID and trying to get through that obstacle. Um, anyone that knows Louisiana, the past couple of years, we've been hit with hurricane after hurricane after hurricane. And this team, no matter what, with their homes with no power and no running water, still was coming into work and making sure the mission was going to happen. So couldn't be prouder of the team and the energy is just, you can't even explain it in words. Yeah, for me, I grew up in South Florida, so I've I've uh, been around launches, and I've I was always fired up about that. Um, this experience is extremely gratifying, you know, to know that you're part of, you know, really the start of, you know, something big, something that you know historically significant, deep space exploration, and what makes it uh, more significant, more meaningful for me is being able to share the experience with my family. Um, with my wife and, and our four kids. Um, I think they're as excited as I am. And so that's just great to see that, see the excitement. So I was a, a young young boy laying in the floor watching uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepping out on the moon. And I remember rolling over and telling my parents, that's what I want to do someday. So that motivated me to go to engineering school, to get two degrees to get into the NASA world just as quickly as I could after graduation. I like to say I wasn't born in Huntsville, but I got there as fast as I could. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's, it's, this, is, this is our Apollo. You know, that's, that's really what it is. And, and I'll, I'll say on the, on the non-emotional front, our, our team has to manage their emotions right now. I'll get to emotions in a second, because we have three very clear objectives. Get the vehicle to orbit, test it, understand how it operates, understand where we may need to come home early if something's wrong and make that decision. We have to get it to orbit and test it. Um, we have to test the heat shield coming back and we have to recover the vehicle. Um, and we have to balance risk through that whole mission. Every time we make a decision, we commit to go to the moon, we've made a decision that limits how we can come back. We still have options. We might have to decide, do we need to come back? Um, and beneath all of that is this incredible pride that people have in what they've done, in what their families have given up, in what they've given up. You know, people have lost marriages to this program, right? People, people have, have given up hobbies that they've had their entire lives because this business is absolutely crazy fun to be in. And uh, so beneath all of that technical, <laughs> All of those decisions we have to make, the pride and emotion that people have is truly, truly incredible. I think that's a great note to wrap up on. Uh, Jim, anything you want to add in, for closing remarks? No, I, I just, I, I just want to emphasize that this is the team that has made it happen. Um, I sat at the flight readiness review the other day where, you know, there are tremendous people in that room. And I sat at the start of it, I said, 99% of the people responsible for getting us there to that flight readiness review were not in the room. And those are the folks that I want to highlight and, and ask all of these folks on your team to thank them for me personally and thank their families. And uh, that's what this is about is the people that built it and the people that really have ownership of that. And for me, that's everybody really across the world when you look at this panel, but certainly those folks in the U.S. that, uh, that helped us get here. Thanks. And, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. You can learn more about the mission by going to nasa.gov slash specials slash Artemis dash Roman numeral one. That's all lowercase letters. 
And um, thank you for joining us.